there is an archetype of human being that I find absolutely hilarious. And that is the person that says something with absolute 100% confidence and certainty, and then they turn out to be wrong. But do these people ever apologize or acknowledge that they're wrong? Oh, no, 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 no. They would never do that. They find some mental gymnasium inside their heads, which allows them to pretend that they were never wrong all along. In fact, they were in the correct position. And us normal people can just like sit back there and laugh at them, especially with the age of the internet. I feel like these people pop up all the time. But even funnier than just laughing at some random loser Larry is when someone's pretending to speak for God. Yes, someone is pretending that they are hooked in, have an antenna that's just getting straight to the transmitter of Jesus himself, and they are getting fed direct information from God. And whenever people do this, and then something's wrong, I find it absolutely hilarious. So I've taken it upon myself to compile a short list of some of the uh, funniest and wackiest things that the governing body of Jehovah's Witnesses have said throughout the years and look at how those confident things that they said have aged. And I'm going to tell you what, it's not like fine wine. It's not even like a French fry from McDonald's that got stuck between your car seat because those things age beautifully like five years later. No. Nah. This is this is some moldy, stinky oranges or cheese in the back of your refrigerator that you forgot about. So, with all that being said, comment down below if you want me to do a part two if I missed anyone. Or comment, let me know what are your favorite uh, little things that didn't age too well from Watchtower. And, uh, yeah, with that, let's do this. Hello and welcome back to the JW Thoughts channel. My name is Wally and today, like I said, we are looking at some goofy quotes from Watchtower that didn't age too well. Uh, I know sometimes people ask, hey, can you put a link in the description to where you're getting uh, these articles from? So I've actually kept track of it this time. So if you look down in the description, uh, you can actually see where these quotes are taken from. Most of them are just from JW Library. And if you want to send it to your relatives just to laugh at them that are still holding on to every word of the governing body, this makes it look absolutely ridiculous. Hey, and while you're down in that description, don't forget to drop a like on the video and subscribe to the channel because it helps get out to more people on YouTube. With all of that being said, I thought it would be appropriate that we start with what has Watchtower said about Jehovah's Witnesses and in particular elders apologizing when they've made a mistake. So this comes from a 1993 Watchtower when an elder makes a mistake. Admitting mistakes and making sincere apologies will also help Christian elders to work harmoni together harmoniously and show honor to one another. An elder may be reluctant to admit a mistake because he fears that this will undermine his authority in the congregation. However, trying to justify, ignore, or minimize a mistake is much more likely to cause others to lose confidence in his oversight. A mature brother who humbly apologizes, perhaps for some thoughtless remark, earns the respect of others. So, Watchtower back in the 90s, they were all about apologizing. Hey, you know, you got to be quick to apologize. People are going to lose respect for you. No one was going to respect someone that's just one of these Larry losers that never apologizes when they get something wrong, right? Well, what does the modern day Jehovah's Witness look like? Well, take a look. Well, knowing this, then we are not embarrassed about adjustments that are made, uh, nor do is an apology needed for not getting it exactly right previously. Are you not ashamed of yourself? Are you not embarrassed? This is really embarrassing. So at the most recent annual meeting of Jehovah's Witnesses, one of the governing body members just came out and said, we don't need to apologize. We ain't even embarrassed by making adjustments. So back in the day, they were like, hey, we need to apologize when mistakes are made. Now they are standing on this hill of, hey, we don't need to apologize. We're getting direct messages from God, even though... Everything that we thought was right was actually wrong. I just wanted to start with this one because it really sets the precedent or sets the tone for how the modern day governing body has taken such a massive shift away from some of the core principles that most people would have grown up with, especially if they're in their 
they're in their 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s. Uh, things have changed so massively. The organization appears to be almost unrecognizable from what it once was. But this one's hilarious. Before, hey, yeah, of course, you'll lose respect if you don't apologize. Now, nah, we ain't apologizing for sh Next up, let's look at what Jehovah's Witnesses used to consider to be a core part of their worship. So it's kind of a two-parter here. So first off, we're going to look at a kingdom ministry from the 80s where it's talking about, uh, or the whole article is talking about the importance of reporting your field ministry activity accurately. And, you know, it gives the full rundown. It was actually a two-part series uh, just about how you can report it accurately. Hey, you're driving in your car. You're getting ready. That doesn't count, buckaroo. Don't try and pull a fast one on us. So they used to be very stringent about counting your time. And uh, one of the reasons they gave for it was this. What if our kingdom ministry would tell us each month that some were out in field service during past months and they spent a number of hours at it and placed some literature and so forth? We would hardly get excited. Rather, we are encouraged as we see the fine results of our combined efforts from month to month in the field service report, blah, 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 blah. So that was one aspect of it was, hey, how can we give this encouraging report if people aren't showing us what they're doing accurately? Because if you just looked at it and said, well, I'm sure some people somewhere went out in service, so cool. It doesn't really drum up very much exciting. And for that reason, I kind of would have to agree with Watchtower there, just knowing that there are X amount of random people isn't all that exciting. Anyway, uh, they take it a little bit or uh, one step further. And this one, I believe, was from 2014, a Watchtower article uh, that had this to say. Our sacrifices of praise are personal offerings voluntarily made to God because we love him. But we have been asked to report our activity in the ministry. So what attitude should we have towards this arrangement? We report the report we submit each month is connected with our godly devotion. They link it to a, a core element of your worship. It is connected to your godly devotion. Something that is fundamental to worshiping the Almighty was giving an accurate report of what you did in the ministry. Well, how did this quote age? We are pleased to announce that beginning November the 1st, 2023, congregation publishers will no longer be asked to report the amount of time they spend in the ministry, nor will publishers be asked to report their placements, the videos they show, or their return visits. Now, I've enhanced the audience's reaction a little bit because I, I think I missed it the first time I watched it. But my oh my, is it crazy how everyone just gasps. You can hear, huh? Because when you, t when you tell Jehovah's Witnesses, okay, this used to be something that was connected to your worship of God. It was fundamental. Now all of a sudden, it's not fundamental because the governing body just decided that it was no longer a core tenant of your worship to God. So the initial audience reaction, I found absolutely fascinating. So I think that one didn't age very well, because if something can be a fundamental part of worship, and then the next day, so you, you go, you're a Jehovah's Witness, and okay, I have to do this thing. And then the next day, you're a Jehovah's Witness, and like, well, I guess I don't have to do that thing anymore that was so important. It starts to create these little schisms in your mind where... Hopefully, you start questioning things, and I think the confusion that's going to arise from all of these changes is definitely going to do that. Anyway, let's move on. So for this next one, a, a little, tiny little bit of context is needed, and I have talked about this previously in video, so I won't go on some long-winded diatribe about it, but in essence, Watchtower has this long-standing tradition where they try and discourage people from insisting on their personal freedoms. The heck does insisting on your personal freedoms mean? Well, when it comes to matters of 
choice that could potentially offend someone in the congregation, what Watchtower basically says is unity is more important than whatever you want to do. Y your opinion doesn't matter because it's for the greater good and the unity of the congregation. So if there's one person that's offended over someone wearing a yellow tie, well, don't wear yellow ties. Don't insist on your personal freedom because, you know, maybe there's people that get offended that you have a yellow tie. I've never heard of that specific example, but that's the mindset that they have. So with that sort of foundation, let's jump into a Watchtower article from the 70s and look what it has to say. Christians, therefore, should not think just because a certain practice is common in the world that they may insist on such as being their right in the face of the Christian congregation and its mature thinking. Why should a Christian try to bring the world spirit or thing or the things that represent it, such as extreme styles of dress, extreme music, and so-called modern practices into his life when he is part of the congregation? In fact, why should he try to bring these things into the congregation of God? So... We can see that back then in the 70s, they had this idea that, you know, we don't care what the world is doing. We have our standards and they're up here. You know, the world standards are just going to keep going down, but our standards are going to remain the same. And then a little later on in that article, it says this. Should we cause a stir in the congregation or become independent minded and withdraw even a little from full cooperation with the congregation now? Rather, as we see the storm clouds of the Great Tribulation getting darker and the climate of this world more chilling, we should draw closer to the Christian congregation, closer and closer together in the warmth of love. Uh, we should be extra careful of our attitude and our standing with God. So, again, again, this was in the 70s, but they had this idea, why would you want to exercise this independent mindset when we should be focusing on staying close with the congregation and following all of our ridiculous rules. And then later on uh, in this exact same article in paragraph 23, it says this, uh, or it asks the question, what was the situation in Israel for a man who preferred to be clean-shaven instead of growing a beard? We can view the matter of style or of dress from another standpoint. Suppose that you, as a man, lived in Israel, Israelite times under the law and did not like a beard. Perhaps you liked the way Egyptians looked, clean-shaven. What would you do? Would you exercise your personal right to shave? No, for you would not have such a right. You would have to wear a beard because the law commanded all males you must not cut your side locks or blah, blah, blah. So... They kind of do this little reverse engineering. Well, what if you were an Israelite and you didn't want to have a beard? Well, you'd have to have one as a way to say, hey, if you want a beard, well, now you can't have one, which is a really stupid way but of, of explaining why you wouldn't want to be wearing a beard. But this kind of explains how they felt about it before. A, they wanted to be separate from the world. They wouldn't want any modern trends or let the world's style direction uh, have any influence in what their directions would be. If the world's doing one thing, well, we don't care what they're up to because we already have our standards from the Bible. And that's how they always explained people not wearing beards. Well, was that consistent? The governing body has concluded that there is a need to clarify this matter. The governing body does not have an issue with brothers wearing beards. Why not? Because the scriptures do not condemn the wearing of beards. In one of the most hilarious turnarounds uh, in Watchtower history, uh, you gotta laugh at it because originally when they first started way back when, everyone wore a beard, it wasn't a big deal, and my cat battery camera just died. So uh, yeah, we've already talked about this ad nauseum, uh, but yeah, with all that being said, let's move on to the next one. Now let's move on to one of the more embarrassing situations that Watchtower created for itself by giving themselves a soft cap on when the end would come. We know, and we've talked about before, the various times where they've given a hard set date, but this one was a little bit lighter after the whole 1975 debacle. They haven't been as hardcore, but uh, according to my memory, and it's been a while since I've researched this and I found one and figure that's good enough, 
but I think it was three or four times that they had said the end would come before the end of the century. So let me read a quote. Uh, it says, as indicated by an article on page 56 of the U.S. News and World Report of January 14th, 1980, quote, if you assume that 10 is the age at which an event creates a lasting impression on a person's memory, end quote, then there are today more than 13 million Americans who have a recollection of World War I. And if the wicked system of this world survived until the turn of the century, which is highly improbable in view of the world's trends and the fulfillment of Bible prophecy, there would still be survivors of the World War I generation. However, the fact that their number is dwindling is one more indication that the conclusion of the system of things is moving fast toward its end. So that's why I say they kind of gave themselves a soft cap. They said, man, it would be highly improbable. And even if the improbable happened, there would still be people that witnessed what happened during World War I, 1914. Well, how does that look in 2024, nearly 25 years after the turn of the century? Well, it looks pretty silly because, to my knowledge, there's not that many people running around that are 125 years old. You're just not going to... Yeah. So, I think that it's hilarious that they, <laughs> that they gave themselves this sort of soft cap because they must have been like, man, I really hope no one notices these, these quotes that we've been making. Uh, these promises that we've been making, basically, to Jehovah's Witnesses that have given their entire life to the organization, all through the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, and then once they got to the 90s, they're like, oh man, this generation thing. Anyway, let's uh, see how this quote aged, though. This generation will by no means pass away until all these things happen. Well, we immediately think back to the September 2015 JW Broadcasting addition, Brother Splain masterfully explained this uh, generation and what all it entailed. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> ah, yes, the old overlapping generation. So if at first you don't succeed, you just start making stuff up. So the master of explaining things, David Splain, uh, he basically just said, you know, one generation could actually just be two generations. And as everyone sat there scratching their balls and their heads like, okay, I guess that's how it's going to go. But I find it hilarious that they gave themselves this, oh, it's never going to happen past the turn of the century. And here we are nearly 25 years into the turn of the century, and we're still chugging along. And I think it's appropriate to make a prediction I can fully see them backing away from this whole generation thing again. I think with them doing some of these minor changes, making these incremental adjustments, I think in the next year or two, we're going to see them start turning around on some of these big ones. So I could fully see a situation where the generation thing is just kind of swept under the rug, put in the bin all together. Let's just focus on love and community and and, and really loving people, because that's what it's really all about. Anyway, this one has to be one of the most embarrassing uh, things that Watchtower said that really didn't age very well. Now, for some of you guys that don't know, Watchtower historically has been very critical of other religions using uh, symbols or any type of iconography uh, as part of their worship, whether that be Mary, statues, a Jesus fish, a cross, whatever the case might be, any sort of like symbolism, they've always really and harshly poo-pooed as being satanic of origin. God would never want to have statues and it's idolatry. But they have a kind of an interesting little turnaround that happened. So let me take you back uh, to a kingdom ministry that said this. The Bible, however, sets forth no visible symbol for Christianity. Christians today, therefore, must be on guard not to adopt such a symbol. For example, watchtower-like designs appear on some buildings and kingdom halls of Jehovah's Witnesses. There is nothing wrong with these in themselves. Possibly they may help persons to identify property owned by Jehovah's Witnesses. However, at no time should anyone look up, look upon such things with rever reverence, as if they were a visible sign of Christianity. 
So back in the past, sometimes when they would build a kingdom hall, the, the brick masons would, you know, make maybe make a little a watchtower thing as part of the, the design structure, or they would have like what the watchtower logo on something of the building. And they were like, okay, yeah, some places have that. They didn't have too big, too much of a hoopla about it. Well, then everything changed in 2009 where they had this questions from readers that came out where it uh, was asking the question, is it appropriate for congregations or individuals to use the logos of legal corporations used by Jehovah's Witnesses? explaining what a logo is because people don't understand the most basic of terms and, and then one of the reasons that they uh, don't want people doing this uh, they mention is such use of the organization's logos may cause confusion for public officials publishers and others about the legal affiliation of the congregation within the organization's legal entities uh, similarly, written correspondence could be misinterpreted as being approved or sent from the world headquarters or the branch office. The Watchtower logo, or a variation of it, should not be used in future Kingdom Hall projects, even if the Kingdom Hall is used by Watchtower Entity. Uh, congregations with existing Kingdom Halls that bear a logo are not required to make immediate changes to signs or designs, since such changes may involve major alterations and much time, effort, and expense. However, consideration should be given to making a change if it would be minor and wouldn't require extensive work. Otherwise, it can be made when the building or sign is scheduled for renovation. So, I remember when this came out, and uh, all of the Kingdom Halls were having their signs changed. They were filling in the little things with bricks, so it didn't have any watchtower symbols. Everyone was freaking out. Oh, we're not allowed to show anything that's watchtower related. And the reason, oh man, it could confuse public officials, and publishers, every the legal affiliation. The whole world would just be in chaos and pandemonium. Po pandemonium, if we had our logos. Well. Fast forward just five years in 2014, and uh, we have this. You will be pleased to know that the governing body has approved displaying the official logo for JW.org on assembly halls and kingdom halls. The sign should match the attached sample, which shows the official design font. Uh, the sign should be displayed in an appropriate, dignified way, give some specifications, even goes and shows the, uh, the uh, values for the color so people can make them. The... So, a total shift. You know, I think the first one was 2009. Fast forward five years, 2014, when the whole rebranding of the organization started. 2014 is when the broadcast was starting to kick up. That's when they were starting to implement the cart witnessing. That is the time when things really started to kick into high gear about Watchtower trying to rebrand itself. Which, ten years later, they are still trying to do, but faster than ever. The funniest part of this, though, is before they were like, oh, you don't have to make any alterations to the Kingdom Hall. It might cause an expense. They, The Watchtower didn't actually provide these signs. They said, okay, here's the specifications for it that you have to display on every single Kingdom Hall. But they, Watchtower didn't give them the sign. And if they wanted to order a sign, they would have to pay for it. So the congregations would have had to you know, shell out however much this was. I can't remember exactly how much it was because we had to do the same thing. And I can't remember. I want to say it was like something irrational. And we ended up, I can't remember if we ordered ours. I just remember there was like a discussion of like, well, should we order it from there just for convenience? Uh, but it was more expensive to order it from Watchtower than ju to just do it ourselves. It was like a whole kerfuffle. But anyway, I just find it absolutely hilarious that just in a five-year period that they managed to completely date themselves. Like, oh, man, it could, could cause all this confusion. And, oh, everyone would just be running around. And now it's like, we want everyone to know JW.org. So it's so funny looking at all these things. It just becomes so clear how just completely... God is out of the picture. This is just some guys fumbling over and over again down through the decades. Now, this next one is super funny because it's not something they said one time or over the course of a decade. This one they said with absolute confidence to the tune of about 60 years, which makes it just absolutely hysterical. So, uh, let me jump back to one of the examples that I could find that was directly with letterhead. Uh, this was a letter 
that went out from the Watchtower and Bible Tract Society. It was answering a question that a congregation was asking about 1954. That's not relevant for what we're talking about, but in the second paragraph, whether or not a person is of the body of Christ is not for us to say. So when he's talking about the body of Christ, that is talking about um, the Jehovah's Witness teaching that only 144,000 special people will actually be raised to heaven and the rest of faithful Christianity, Jehovah's Witnesses will live here on earth. Uh, so just establishing that. Now the last paragraph, membership in Christ's body is now complete. Hence, any of the other sheep that receive the anointing can only receive such because of the unfaithfulness of one of the members, which is possible. So back in 1953, they said that that number, 144,000, was donezo. Bingo, bango, bongo. No more people are coming in except if someone is unfaithful. So 1953, they are saying, no, that number is complete. It, it is all, all good to go. Now, over the next years and years and years and years, they continue this trend of pointing to the number of people that are claiming to be of that special 144,000 continuing to go down as evidence that the end is getting closer and that they have God's blessing. So here in the 90s, they are going on this exact same thing. They bring up some of the statistics, but here it says... Clearly, as the decades passed, the number of those professing to be of the remnant greatly decreased. Some 52,000 in 1935, 11,500 in 1965, 8,600 in 1995. However, those with earthly hopes have been blessed and their numbers has increased abundantly. So all the way up until the 90s, they were continuously pointing to this as evidence that Jehovah's Witnesses are correct in this claim, and they said it with confidence. Well, how did that turn out for you? Well, what were the grand totals this last year? Well, the memorial partakers worldwide were 22,000. Yes, double what they were in 1965. Double. So they said this with absolute confidence. Oh, the number is clearly closed. And then that generation, goes back to that generation teaching, actually died off, so they had to extend it, and then everything went wild from there. They even went so far to try and cover their own tracks to suggest that anyone that was partaking, it was merely a calculating error, because people aren't perfect that are, you know, oh, well, they drank, of, or drank the wine and ate the bread. But they went so far as to say that some people are suffering from mental illness. And that is why the numbers are going up. Instead of just coming out and saying, no, it's actually because we changed the teaching and it opened the doorway for it. Anyway, I made a whole video about that like two years ago. Uh, it's, I think the thumbnail is called Detective Wally or something. Anyway, it's kind of silly. But for fear of this video going on too long, let's wrap it up and look at our very last one. Now it was only appropriate to finish on a banger and that is... Women wearing slacks. So this was a long-standing tradition, and it was based off of this scripture in Deuteronomy 22, 20, or verse 5, where it says, you know, you don't want to look like the opposite sex. So let's just, I'll just read this whole thing because I think there's so many things that are absolutely hilarious about it. So in view of this pro prohibition, is it proper for a woman to wear slacks? The evident purpose of this law was to pre prevent sex abuses and confusion of sexual identity. In appearance and attire, normally a man wants to look like a male and a woman wants to look like a female. For an Israelite to act contrary to this internal sense of proprietary, pro, pro, propriety, <laughs> wow, I really butchered that, could have led to homosexuality. Now, first off, let me just start, stop right there. I don't think they really understand how this works. I, as you guys know, I like to do skits and stuff. When I put on a wig or I wear lipstick, I, it doesn't make me attracted to men. <laughs> it's, that is like an internal thing. Like, I'm not attracted to men. I don't know what else to tell you. But just because I put on a skirt doesn't automatically make me say, Oh, man, now all of a sudden I guess I'm okay. They just don't get it whatsoever, but that level of being out of touch just really makes me slap my knee and, and have a bit of a belly laugh because 
It's like, oh, well, I guess I'm going to put on earrings and hey, I'm gay. <laughs> it's great. Anyway, let's keep going. Although both men and women then wore robe-like garments, there was a difference between the garb of males and that of females. Similarly, in some parts of the earth today, both men and women wear slacks, though the styles differ from each. The principle in this text would not rule out a Christian woman wearing slacks sometimes, as when working around the house or on a farm. <laughs> And according, and according to local customs and necessity, slacks may be the desired attire in very cold climates. The Bible counsels women to adorn themselves in well-arranged dress with modesty and soundness of mind. So there are just countless times throughout the decades where Watchtower uh, said this. And they, they use this very specific wording, you know, wearing slacks when around the house or when working on the farm. Cut generously to fit a mom's body. Get a free applique mom jeans vest with every purchase this weekend at JCPenney. <laughs> I know these are old watchtowers, but I just like some dude writing this legislation out for women and them thinking, hmm, yeah, I guess if they're going to go out and milk the cows, it might be okay that they don't, we don't have to go full Amish mode. They don't have to wear dresses when they're plucking the rutabagas from the ground. It is so weird. But anyway, after years and years and years of saying women can only wear it if they're cleaning the house or working on the farm, well, how has this stance, this, this direction from God, how has it aged? The governing body has decided that sisters may choose to wear slacks when participating in the ministry and when attending Christian meetings, assemblies, and conventions. And there we have it. Watchtower's ever-changing doctrine is always hilarious. But comment down below. Let me know what some of your favorite changes that they've made or the things that just haven't aged very well. With all that being said, don't forget to drop a like on the video and subscribe to the channel if you're still around. And stay safe, be kind, and show yourself the same kindness that you show to others.